Hello everyone, uh, my name is Cornelius Nomechi, I'm a medical doctor from Ghana. I completed my MPA degree at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health this past summer. Last year, uh, during my application process, I had the pleasure of working with Dr. Banda Khalifa, who is a friend and a senior colleague. Uh, Dr. Banda's um, knowledge and experience of the graduate application process made it easier to write an outstanding uh, personal statement, also aim for the right test course and finding the right people to write recommendation letters for me. He also gave me a really good insight about the funding landscape available for me for my education. Um, I was able to get admission into most of the top schools that I applied for, including Johns Hopkins, Columbia University, Boston University, and then Harvard University. Yeah, so if you are actually looking to advance your studies and you're looking for a good and friendly coach, I would recommend no other person than Dr. Banda. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Banda Khalifa, a PhD student at Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and an MPH MBA Summer Scholar alum. I've navigated the graduate school application process, gaining admission into institutions like Harvard, Yale, Columbia, and Johns Hopkins. And now I'm here to help you on your journey. Remember, the journey to graduate school may seem tough, but with the right tools and mindset, you'll be on your way to success. Don't forget to check out my other videos for more tips and insights. Until then, keep learning, keep growing, and keep pushing forward. Dr. Banda, signing up. Hello, everyone. I am Emmanuel Animashal. I'm a Nigerian physician. I met Dr. Banda sometime last year. Um, I remember I had a very difficult time trying to prepare my application packages to schools of public health in the United States. And I went online in search of you know, um, information and then I came across his LinkedIn profile. I remember I connected with him and then I spent a long day going through his profile and I found really very interesting things where he had shared insights into a lot of um, the application, you know, a lot of components of the application process. I also eventually got to follow his YouTube account, saw a lot of videos, and I saw that, you know, he had a lot of stuff that were quite inspiring. For one, I liked the fact that he had gone through the process. He had really nice admission offers when he was going to, you know, move to the United States. And that gave me some sort of assurance that he, he had gone through it and I could as well, you know, go through the same process that he had gone through using the advice that he had given. It was really helpful. Um, he also organized a couple of live sessions. I remember where he brought in um, faculty, you know, people who were in charge of admissions in some of these schools. And that was really very helpful for me. And I followed this process, you know, um, basically I followed through with everything that he recommended and I got really good results. At the end of the application cycle, I got admitted into um, Johnson Hopkins University, Harvard, Yale, Emory. And, and I mean, those were like, I, I really didn't apply to much schools because I, I sort of believed in the processes that he had outlined and I got admitted into the schools that I applied to. Um, and I got really good scholarship offers too. Um, I eventually chose to come to Hopkins, um, where I am currently enrolled in the MPH MPH dual degree program. And I must say, it was also very helpful in selecting which school I would eventually come to. Because I had a really tough time trying to decide. You know, when you have really good offers, you have a hard time deciding. And it was very helpful. I recommend that everyone who is applying to um, schools of public health or to, to graduate school generally in the United States should definitely follow um, Dr. Banda on his LinkedIn, his YouTube, follow him everywhere. And you can be rest assured that he's always ready to answer your questions and you know um, attend to your concerns. You don't even have to necessarily always speak with him just by following his pages and following up with the activities. You definitely are on a good path. Hi, Thanks. my name is Ama Isiman and I'm a physician from Ghana. Two years ago, I decided to apply for the law degree MPH and MBA at Hopkins. So I went onto the Hopkins website and looked for parents and past students who had gone through the program. And I was happy to see a Ghanaian face there. Um, I saw Dr. Banda on the Hopkins website. So I looked him up on LinkedIn, reached out to Dr. Banda on LinkedIn because I had specific questions about the dual degree MBA MPH program here and about the summer scholarship as well because I was interested in he was doing the program under the summer scholarship. He answered my questions, helped me assess my fit for the program, and down the line also talked me through and 
how to communicate with like you know the school officials with some of the different questions I had and who to talk to as well. Fast forward today I'm here at Hopkins and a dual degree student pursuing my MBA and MPH. I'm a summer scholar and I go into all the schools I apply. So if you're thinking of applying for graduate school here, yeah, whether it's an MPH or a PhD program, I recommend watching his videos on YouTube and LinkedIn because they have very helpful information in there. Thank you. My name is Emmanuel Elomnote Adom. I'm a physician from Ghana. I've had vast clinical practice uh, back at home, but then um, I realized I needed to move my career forward, um, move my career a notch up. Um, so I decided to pursue um, further education that would help me gather the knowledge and skills to be able to do that. I got in touch with my senior colleague and friend, Dr. Banda Khalifa. He has been of immense help and he has been a great resource in this journey. He helped me through my application process and provided top-notch mentoring and guidance um, you know, throughout the whole process, making it very easy for me. Um, I recommend his services you know, to a T because he's one special human being and one selfless professional. Um, he's a reason why I got admission into all the elite schools that I applied to, including the Johns Hopkins University, Harvard University, um, University of North Carolina, Yale University, Columbia University, and others. Um, he was great in this process because I tailored my application not only to get admission, but also to get some really juicy scholarship offers from some, some of these great universities and I really appreciate him. He's a reason why I'm currently enrolled in the dual MPH MBA program at the Johns Hopkins University. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, wherever you're watching from. This is his, his Scholar's Table. I'm your host, uh, Dr. Banda Khalifa. I'm excited to have you here with me today. Um, uh, so today's uh, conversation is going to be a little bit different. We are going to talk a little bit about academia, uh, also explore global health in its entirety and then uh, we'll have a very special guest joining us uh dr uh professor jennifer nuzo uh, from uh the brown university uh, she's the director of the pandemic center at brown university and a, uh, and a professor of epidemiology um i mean reading through her profile i couldn't quite uh decide which element to leave out uh, because it's it's really really uh, impressive. Um, so she's nationally and globally uh, acclaimed. She stands, uh, you know, as as a beacon of knowledge on global health security uh, and issues on public health preparedness. Uh, if you ever come across the Global Health Security Index, those of us who got exposed to it uh, earlier in our career. Um, that is her um, work. Um, so beyond her academic pursuit, uh, she's been instrumental during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, advising national government organizations and lending her expertise even to the film industry. Um, I'm sure you might have seen her insights in renowned publications like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and even shows like the last week tonight with uh, John Oliver. 
So in today's episode, we are going to explore the graduate school application, especially Brown University um, uh, 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 and, and the strategies for application in general. And then we'll, we'll look at the role of DRPH in academia. I know when people hear about DRPH, they immediately think it's, it's something that uh, you know, has no place in academia. I will also talk briefly about the Global Health Security Index. So without um, wasting much time, let's invite our special guest to the program. Um, Professor Nudo, we are so excited to have you today. Uh, welcome to the Scholar's Table. Thank you so much. What a privilege. It's really, um, it's really, I'm glad to be joining you. Great conversations that you're brokering. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. So uh, to, to, to start off, um, those of us, you know, sometimes uh, one of the things that I like my guests to kind of um, break the ice with is to introduce themselves and then talk briefly about their career trajectory. I know most people in the global health sphere don't quite have a linear trajectory, right? It's, it's ups and down. So how has your career been like so far and, and uh, at your current role uh, in, at Brown University? Um, how, how, are you, how are you doing? Oh, well, thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I very much support the, uh, what you just said, which is that public health careers are often not linear. And um, certainly mine hasn't. And really, if I, you know, if you told me 20 some odd years ago when I was just thinking about entering uh, the field of public health, whether I would have taken the trajectory that I did, I, you know, wouldn't have believed it. And I'm not sure if anybody set out to have the same trajectory that they could. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's not uncommon. I think most people have careers that, that go in those sort of directions. And I, I think what I see as sort of the overarching principle is that uh, public health education trains you, it gives you, uh, if it's good, it gives, it gives you a set of skills and tools that you can apply uh, to the public health problems of the day. And depending on where you live and depending on at what time your career is taking place, uh, those public health threats change. And so I think a hallmark of a career, at least one that's oriented around impact, is that you kind of go where the issues take you and go where you think you have the ability to contribute and to apply the skills and tools that you have to make a difference. So that I think um, has been my North Star and I think it's the North Star for, for a lot of people. And so that's why I think you see careers that take a winding um, direction. But I didn't really start out. Um, so I'm currently an academic. I'm a uh, professor of epidemiology and director of the Pandemic Center, as you mentioned, at, at Brown University School of Public Health. This is a new role for me. Mm -hmm. uh, I came to Brown about two years ago, uh, having uh, been at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health, where I was an associate professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering. I trained at Johns Hopkins in epidemiology. As you mentioned, I got a DRPH uh, in epidemiology. I actually don't think that degree program, that specific degree program exists anymore, um, which was a shame because it really equipped me with the skills uh, that I have been able to use uh, to work at sort of the intersection of um, uh, you know, public health research and and practice. Um, but, you know, I didn't anticipate uh, taking an academic uh, path. In fact, I started out after I got my master's um, uh, from Harvard School of Public Health, working as a, a practicing epidemiologist. I worked for New York City. And um, my life and my career uh, was really changed by the events of September 11th. Uh, you know, I was someone who was working on uh, drinking water quality. I was working to make sure New Yorkers were um, staying safe, drinking uh, the water that comes out of their taps. And the events of September 11th really changed how we thought about safety uh, mm -hmm. in New York City after that event. And so that really put me um, on the path to what has now become a field, but wasn't really a field at the time of, of health security. Um, and that path took me to Johns Hopkins. I worked for the Center for Health Security, which had been known as by several other names before that, um, and really worked, started doing work at the intersection of, of health and national security and sort of on the, along the way, decided to, to get a doctorate, really felt like that was necessary to have the kind of impact that I wanted. And then um, sort of stayed in academia and um, you have been able to, to advance the issues that I want to advance from outside of government. That's felt, um, I felt like I can make a real contribution in being able to 
do the research that I think is needed and say the things that I think are is needed that's not possible to do within the context of of a government position. So um, I felt very fortunate that I've not run out of things to be interested by and to feel like I'm making an impact. Yeah, that's 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 truly inspiring. And uh, for for most people um, who are hearing, for example, uh, global health security for for the first time, what what it's is the inspiration behind your your passion for uh, global health security and 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 public health preparedness. So global health security really came about as a field um, from the observation that health is not a secondary issue of national importance. Mm -hmm. In fact, health is a primary issue of national importance. So integral to the, uh, you know, the peace and prosperity of countries that it needs to be given the same level of, of attention, investment and support as we give national security. Um, and also showing that, you know, when our health is imperiled, um, such as we've now seen in, in um, you know, recent events, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, it calls into question the security of nations. It calls into question the prosperity of nations, which is so integral to security. If we don't have a healthy public, we don't have a strong economy, we don't have a strong economy, we don't have a healthy public. Mm -hmm. We need both of those things uh, in order to have... Uh, a nation that is secure. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 quite exciting. I mean, the 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 first time I I got into that uh, sphere was around twenty nineteen. I first read about it, and I was quite um, intrigued about the concept uh, of of uh, global health security. And since then, I've I've been a passionate advocate of of that. Um, so I know, like you, you've been associated with Hopkins and uh, and now currently at Brown. Um, how was your experience like for for you know for those who don't know how it is to 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 be, for example, a faculty at Hopkins? Uh, I mean, you've you've got an opportunity to experience both sides, right? How how would you rate your experience at Hopkins like? Uh, well, I'm a proud alumna of Hopkins, so I'm nice <laughs> on that. Um, and I'm still actually involved. I have um, still mentoring students there, so uh, the ties haven't been severed. Um, but uh, I sort of um, bittersweetly left my full-time role at Johns Hopkins a couple of years ago to come to Brown uh, School of Public Health. And I really did that because of my experiences um, dealing with with COVID-19 and, and from mm -hmm. the position, the academic position that I had, you know, I was someone who had been working on pandemic preparedness for, you know, the entirety of my career, near entirety of my career. And uh, the performance of countries like the U.S. and really many, many other countries, I don't think any country emerged from this pandemic as a clear winner in any way. I think yeah. all countries had strengths and weaknesses, some more so than others none i would say would rate give themselves an a or possibly even a b for their for their performance um just seeing what the struggles were and how many common struggles there were really made me feel that we needed a bit of a blank slate when it came to pandemic preparedness mm -hmm. you know to be able to say okay we got it so wrong in so many ways let's start with a fresh piece of paper <laughs> and think think new about what we need to do to make sure this never happens again and um, part of what I saw as being, you know, really a major driver in the challenges that so many countries faced, they weren't really medical or public health issues. You know, I mean, the fact that we, within a year, developed multiple safe and effective vaccines was a real triumph of science. It's uh, not a, a miracle by any means because it was the result of decades of investment and hard research. But the fact that more people died, not only in the United States, but across the globe after the development of multiple safe and effective vaccines really mm -hmm. points to the fact that like technologies and science and public health um, practice alone is not sufficient to protect us. And really where we struggled were issues of politics. It was it issues of economics. It was issues of uh, you know, behavior, multiple different things, fields that fall a bit outside of what public health teaches and studies and researches. 
Uh, not to say that those issues don't, you know, have tentacles into the work that we do, but it, it is a bit adjacent. And I really felt like if we were going to make meaningful progress, like get ready for real and not just, you know, pursue placebo plans, uh, you know, plans that don't do much, but we think are going to be fine. They maybe make us feel better for a short time, uh, that we were going to have to um, make real live connections to these other disciplines. And so mm-hmm. that was really why I wanted to come to Brown because Brown is sort of famous for having a, a true spirit of interdisciplinary collaboration. Um, it's got that culture of interdiscipline that supports interdisciplinary collaboration. Plus it's a small enough place where you can meaningfully do that. Um, add to that, the School of Public Health is new and mm-hmm. um, and its roots are in community medicine. So it, so it you know, started off as a school that was already working out in communities. Um, all of that to me felt like really, really fertile ground to kind of pursue the kind of game changing solutions that I felt like needed to be pursued as opposed to just doing the same thing that we've been doing for the past 20 years and expecting different results. Yeah, that that sounds that sounds exciting. Um yeah, so talking about Brown, um I've I've I mean I've I've had quite a number of uh mentees or colleagues whom I've worked with for a long time and uh when you I mean when they approach you and they ask you like they ask you that they want to attend uh or, or they want to earn an MPH or um a DRPH or a PhD Brown doesn't quite come up easily f- for them um I don't know whether it's uh, is the fact that people are not opening up or maybe the school as you as you rightly said it's it is it, it, not as old as the others so people don't tend to gravitate towards it uh but in your opinion you've been there for almost a year or two um what do you th- why do you think or what do you think sets apart the brown school of public health with other schools of public health mm-hmm. in general what do they have like that is unique uh, yeah. that you can use to, for example, convince others that this is equally a good school? Yeah, so, I mean, I think some of it is that the School of Public Health is is very new. Um, it's uh, just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. So <laughs> that's hard to compare to, like, a Johns Hopkins that recently celebrated its 100th year anniversary. Yeah. Um, and so that, I think, is, is, a, is a, a big difference. It just takes time for schools to kind of get established and get to, to know each other. Um, I will tell you, since coming to Brown, one thing is clear is that anytime we want to pursue something, the underlying question that always gets asked is why us? And there mm-hmm. is a real spirit here that if it's being done elsewhere, we don't need to do it because it's it's already being done. And so I, I think it's never in the school's vision to become the next Harvard or Hopkins because those places exist. I think what we are very much uh, envisioning is doing something differently. And honestly, after this pandemic, I mean, I do think the field of public health needs to take a hard look mm-hmm. at health as a field and to envision um, perhaps a future that is not just what it looked like the last hundred years, but, you know, what is our agenda for the next 100 years? And I think there are some places where we need to kind of overhaul public health education and to uh, start pursuing some some new strategies because I'm not at all convinced in looking at how public health leaders performed that we have equipped people to lead these very important positions with the skills they need for the threats that they're going to see over the next 100 years. And yeah. I think a real clear example of that is looking at like public health communications, for instance, um, real failures there across the board. And I think it's in part the way public health has commu- risk communication, for instance, has been conceived of and taught. I think it's, uh, it's an old model of communication that doesn't take into account social media and the, mm-hmm. the, yeah. the, the, the catalytic role that it's playing in our societies for better or for worse. Um, and I think we need to re-envision uh, public health education. So we're embarking on developing a new program that will be trying to teach communication using different tools that have typically been used in a traditional risk communication way. So uh, I think what you're going to see at this School of Public Health is a lot of innovation and in trying new approaches um, that we think is a little bit more uh, resonant with the current moment that we're in and our anticipate and the our anticipated future. 
Um, the other thing is that we're just smaller. And so this uh, place here has like a really special culture. Uh, everybody knows each other. It's really warm. It's really um, <laughs> supportive, Just which uh, I don't know if that's for everybody. It's certainly great for me. Uh, and um, that I think gives a real spirit. And um, because the school is so well integrated with the broader university, mm -hmm. it is pretty common for students to, we say, go up and down the hill because the, the undergraduate campus and all the other graduate schools are up the hill from us. But uh, there's a lot of swapping of of classes and faculty, et cetera. So you you get experience, you get to be exposed to to much more than I think what you get in some schools of public health that are a bit more siloed. Yeah, that I mean, you've you've made a very critical, some crucial points in in, in terms of public health education and how uh, you know we we'll need to take a second look at I, I, what really we are teaching people. Um, you know, public health professionals shouldn't only have the competency in, in dealing with methodology and other things. It's also about uh, crisis communication and how to eventually communicate your 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 um, findings. That That's truly exciting. But I must admit that, I mean, Brown University in its entirety, it's, it's like one of the top schools um, mm -hmm. in, in the U.S. and in the world. Um, so uh, uh, hopefully... Uh, the School of Public Health, with 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 your help and all the innovative staff that you're bringing on board, would would really attract uh, some of my international students. Um, but for the past couple of years that you've been there, I know you perhaps you you've had the opportunity to engage with uh, uh, admission uh, discussions mm -hmm. or even with mm -hmm. folks that uh, helps uh, make admission decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, what does the Brown University look for in terms of um, mm. qualities or competencies that you are looking for in in applicants. Uh, so, I mean, yeah. every, everybody knows that Brown University is, is an Ivy League, right? So, mm. what what are the qualities to get into uh, such a such an institution? Yeah, I've gotten a bit of a window into this um, in my role. I'm actually chairing a faculty search committee right now, and mm -hmm. um, also I've been part of the doctoral admissions committee. And right. um, one of the things I've learned in the past few years I've been here is that interest in our uh, opportunities has just exploded. <laughs> so mm -hmm. um, that's wonderful. I think people are starting to learn about us and learn about what we do. And I think people are really enthusiastic for, for who we are and what we're doing. Um, it's really encouraging. It's, it's really hard to go through all of the applications and give them um, the kind of attention that we like to, but we, we're trying as, as hard as we can to, to do that. Um, you know, I mean, I think obviously the standard metrics, right? We're looking for people who are, you know, rigorous. They have um, demonstrated their, their abilities to perform um you know at the highest levels uh and um you know that they are um some evidence of uh you know strong evidence of really uh being able to take the the tools that they have available to them and really make mm -hmm. important changes i mean we're looking for people who are you know really the future like the rock stars right the people who are just you know going to come in and take their either their training or their position if they're joining the faculty um, and use that to make real, meaningful, measurable change in the field, whether it be in research uh, or whether it's in, in practice. Um, you know, that I think is really key. Unfortunately, you know, each of these, um, you know, our, our level of interest in these programs like far ex exceeds the number of slots that we have available, um, which, mm -hmm. is, which is quite difficult. I think the other thing that we take very seriously mm -hmm. is the idea that we need to make sure that we have a public health workforce that is um, reflective of, of the world. And one thing that Brown University for International Students should know is that um, it uh, recently made the commitment to be need blind with respect to admissions, even for international students, um, as a part of a recognition that the university is part of a global community and that we shouldn't have, you know, kind of an arbitrary distinction for U.S. applicants versus international applicants. And so that has really, I think, been catalytic, something I'm very proud of that the university has taken, that we recognize our, our, our role as a global educator and mm -hmm. that the world's hardest problems to solve are global problems. And yeah. We need to make 
our reach our reach is global. So that's going to be really important. But I would say I think we're all looking for people who, you know, want to have an impact that's really in the ethos of the school is that we don't just educate to get good jobs and get good salaries. Um, obviously, <laughs> those are things that people think about, but really yeah. we're educating to make a meaningful impact on the world. That's the real culture of Brown. And one of the things I've um, had the privilege of being able to do is to meet with Brown alumni from the graduate programs, and undergraduate programs, and they're all so incredibly proud of their Brown affiliation. They, they use that um, going forward in their careers and they continue to support the school so heavily. So we take our role in building and sustaining the, the larger Brown community, both here and abroad, um, quite seriously. Awesome. Um, uh, is, is there a requirement for GRE? I know most schools have waived the GRE yeah. component. Um, is it the same with Brown University? Yes. Yes. All right. Great. So, um, I'll those tell you, of, I just, well, I'll tell you, as someone who's been on admissions committees, here's what I look for. I'm not sure that everybody looks for them. I pay a lot of attention to personal statements. Mm-hmm. Um, so if some if a student is applying, I want to understand like who you are and what you want to do and why do you want to come here? Yeah, because I don't want to waste your time or your money. If, if that's <laughs> what you think. I want to make sure that we can help you make your mark on the world. And so yeah. the exchange students can talk, you know, applicants can talk about you know why they want to come, what they think they'll do here, that they understand our program, and that they what their plans are for making the most of it. That's really helpful. Um, because we have a lot of like really brilliant people applying, people have done extraordinary things, but we want to make sure we're the right fit for you that we can, you know, uh, use your time here, um, as productively as possible so that you'll, you know, really have a, you know, so that your time here is catalytic in terms of your career. Great. Great. Um, I I want us to talk a little bit about, uh, scholarships. Um, Mm -hmm. I know that is often one of the headaches for international students. Uh, at least they, they would want to uh, get some funding. Uh, so in terms of uh, funding mechanisms, in what ways uh, do students uh, fund their programs, especially international students coming to Brown University? Yeah, so I'm not sure I have all the answers for you because I'm still new and still learning about what the opportunities mm-hmm. are. I do know, as I said, the university has... Um, recently made this commitment to be need blind with respect to uh, international students and, um, you know, does, uh, you know, have support for students uh, who are coming um, with respect to need. Um, I do know that I've, uh, we have this really special program called the Presidential um, Fellowship Program. I think that's what it's called, Presidential Scholars. Anyway, it's a university funded program that supports some of our undergraduate and and graduate students. And I've had the privilege of working with some of those uh, scholars. So their education is funded by the university. uh, And uh, let me tell you, they are incredible. Incredible. I'm working with a doctoral student right now who has a presidential fellowship, and he is just amazing. He's easily one of the the strongest students I've ever encountered. I'm so incredibly fortunate um, to have had the opportunity to work with him, and I'm really proud that the university recognized his talent and put money money behind their mm-hmm. uh, investment him uh, and their commitment to him uh, because uh, he is going to have an extraordinary career. I'm sure of it. Great, great, great. Um, so I, I know you've mentioned about, you know, you, you've spoken a little bit about that statement of purpose or personal statement. Um, how, how do you, I mean, if you're reviewing an application, in terms of importance, where do you place statement of purpose? Is it, is it a top priority or you look at, academic background before you check statement of purpose? I mean, both, both. But the reason why I put so much emphasis on the statement of purpose is because there are a lot of people who apply who have top-notch grades, coming from <laughs> you know, top-notch experiences, yeah. you know, really extraordinary things. Um, it's hard to differentiate. And um, the statement of purpose allows you to sh- tell us who you are and what you want to do. It also allows us to know if we're going to be a good fit for you, because like, let's say you have an interest in some area and we have no faculty actively working on that area. It's going to be hard for us to really mentor you and give you the kind of attention and 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 
and tutoring and uh, you know ad advice that you would deserve as a student. So we want to make sure that not to say you have to have a complete overlap in interests, but that we mm -hmm. can identify someone who can help you. Okay. Uh, otherwise, why? Right? Why come <laughs> and and pursue more education? Obviously, classes are classes. We can teach you, but you know. And I'm, I'm talking about this more in terms of doctoral students, um, but I think it, it helps in terms of master's students, too, because one of the things our master's students uh, go through here is they do a, an applied public health experience, uh, which is meant to really give them like an opportunity to dig into a project. And it's always helpful. And then they do a, a sort of a, uh, I don't know if we... I forget if we call it a capstone, something like a, a bit of a kind of research or practical project. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's helpful if we have people who can who can guide that process and and uh, be there for you outside of classes. Classes are just really one part of your education. You know, I think when you're evaluating schools, you should consider not only what are their course offerings, um, and I would say that the course offerings at schools of public health are pretty consistent. Yeah. They have I mean, especially depending on what your degree program is, there probably isn't a lot of room for extra classes, uh, you know, depending on, on what the program is, um, you know, but if you're someone who thinks I uh, really want to also understand, um, you know, I, one of the things that I've noticed about public health and, and making sure like in this, uh, in this uh, theme of possibly redefining public health education. I mean, I think it's problematic that we can graduate students from schools of public health with like exquisite biostatistical capabilities and exquisite epi methods. Yeah. But no understanding of how the world works. <laughs> no understanding of, uh, you know, the international health regulations and yes. the agents, what, and who, where the real levers of change are. So mm -hmm. that's one mm -hmm. thing, you know, mm -hmm. and so, for instance, if you're like, I want to go, I want to fix that. I want to have my public health education and I want to make sure I understand how the world works. You know, if you came to Brown, you could take classes at the Watson Institute, for instance, where we have like some of the top political science minds and, and public yeah. affairs scholars, right? So, but in the confines of a degree education, there's, there's, there's only so much play, right? Yeah. So the other thing is that where else are you learning? You're learning from your faculty and that occurs within a classroom, but also outside of the classroom through mentoring opportunities, through the discussions, the events that they host, you know, we host weekly webinars. So like just what kind of those sorts of ad hoc conversations happen. And then you learn from the students and who else is there with you learning. And so I would look at those three dimensions. And part of what we're looking at is like whether what we offer is what you need, um, because we don't want to waste your time. <laughs> Great. To that. And then, and then, you know, obviously your grades and, you know, I think it's pretty common for students to have some kind of grade, you know, slip up somewhere, but we want to make sure that there's, uh, you know, evidence that you can, you know, rise to the academic demands, uh, you know, so mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, probably recent and sustained progress is more important than, than one-off uh, issues. Um, Obviously, who your letters of recommendation, you know, your letters of recommendation, hopefully that they're strong. Um, yeah. I would say this is something that we, like I've noticed, is probably harder for international students because often the people recommending them, maybe English isn't their first language. So I, I, I kind of take all of that into consideration, but that's really where the, the statement of purpose can really help me understand who you are, what, uh, what your hopes are for the, the program, how you think you want to spend your time and how we can help you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks so much. Uh, so I, I know you've you just highlighted on um, uh, recommendation letters. Uh, what what would you think would be, for example, the the best strategy in someone who is applying for maybe a GRPH or a PhD in in choosing their recommendation letters? How how should they go about it? Um, I mean, obviously, you want someone who can write you a strong letter. Uh, and so, first of all, you should have a good sense <laughs> that person's going to write you a strong <laughs> be able to write you a strong letter i have a personal policy of anytime a student asks me to write a letter i send the letter to the student before i send it in to make okay. sure the student is aware of what i'm writing and i will just tell you i do that because i think there are some problems with a lack of transparency when we have a lack of transparency so i really don't like having blinded letters 
because I think it can perpetuate bias and discrimination unintentionally. So oh, okay. as a way to hold myself accountable, I make sure that I put some sunlight on my letters and I will not agree to write a letter for a student that I would not want to share the letter with that student. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody's like that. So you have to kind of know that someone's going to be able to write you a, a strong letter. I would say a letter that comes from someone who can write a strong letter is better than a letter from an important, you know, a VIP who hardly yeah. knows you. Writes a <laughs> paragraph. Um, and um, if you're applying for an academic program, you want ideally one of those letter writers at least can speak to your academic achievements mm -hmm. uh, and how great a student you are, because partially what we're going to want to know is can you handle the classes? Yeah. Um, but if you've had some work experience, someone who could speak to your work ethics and your accomplishments and perhaps your vision, um, I think all of that's great. I know many people ask students to write the letters for them. Um, I never do because I don't think students are generally good at writing their own letters, <laughs> in part because it's very awkward and people tend to be humble. Uh, this is not a time for humility. <laughs> so if someone <laughs> asks you to write a letter, you know, think of what your mother or grandmother would say about you, mm -hmm. you know, and so much bragging they would do and do it. The letter writer can tone it down if they need to, but that is not a time to be humble. Yeah, yeah. I think you've made, the, you made some significant points, uh, especially um, uh, choosing a recommender who will likely write you a stronger recommendation as opposed to someone who is just famous in the field, right? Um, if you have one, it's fine. But if that's all you have is a couple of famous people who hardly know you, that, that's going to be like, well, this person doesn't even know, you know? Yeah. And, and often in letters, they describe how they know you. Uh, mm -hmm. And if, so if they can't say that. And so sometimes I've had students who I don't really know ask me for letters. And I'll say, well, I'm happy to write, try to write you a letter. But what I will do then is look at your CV and try to piece something together. But that's probably going to be obvious to the people reading it that I mm -hmm. don't really know you. Yeah. And I'm not sure that helps you. But if you're in a lurch and you have nobody else, I'm happy to try. Uh, but um, the letter writers can tell. And, you know, I when I write a letter for a student and, like, I think the student is the best thing ever, it's so incredibly obvious. Mm -hmm. Um and so you want to find people who can do that for you. Yeah, yeah. I remember my first uh, PhD application. I approached one, I mean, one f famous professor, Hopkins. Um, and he was, ask, he was like, uh, I would love to write you a recommendation letter, but I haven't known you that much for me to give you a very strong letter of recommendation. So you can, you know, just... Uh, look around. If you don't find any of your advisors or m mentors, then you can come back, and then we can, you know, we can put something together. So I, 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 I really understand that um, that perspective. Mm -hmm. In in terms of, I know most most times um, I've spoken to students who intentionally leave out their extracurricular activities, um, but I, I I tell them that elsewhere we don't really value those uh you know activities but here if you're especially if you're applying for at the master's level these things are crucial um in your experience how how do extracurricular activities complement um you know somebody's application uh whether the academic mm -hmm. achievements or their uh, other competencies i think it's helpful i mean you know, first of all, you're looking for a way to differentiate yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, that's, you know, just one of the things. I mean, it is my hope for all of us is that we find ourselves in places that value us for our whole selves, right? So the extent that you show up as not just the, you know, passionate about biostatistics and really good at <laughs> applying certain methods, but also an award-winning dancer. Uh, yeah. Know, I mean... You know, I just, that's, that's your story. And it's, it makes you the kind of multifaceted, interesting person that you are. Um, sometimes people are involved in like uh, volunteerism. And um, I think in, in academia, it's often common to sort of look uh, for people's service. So if you've done any kind of volunteering uh, that's related to the field, that also just helps us understand to what extent you're going to come and grow our community, mm -hmm. not just 
you know, be good in our classes, but help create a place that we all like to come to and work and, you know, socialize with, et cetera. So I think it's helpful. I would not do anything just for the sake of getting into a school because that's transparent, right? <laughs> but if you are, uh, if you are, you know, you have, you have top grades and you're really passionate about biostatistics and you happen to be a championship dancer, that's just going to make your, yeah. make, me, make me remember you more in the whole pile of applications. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't know, all these things, I have to caveat, all of these things are what I think mm -hmm. at, in my role. Uh, I, I can't promise that everybody else mm -hmm. views it this way, but I think some of this is a little bit of human trait, which is just, if you're an interesting person, you're just more memorable. And when you're going through hundreds and hundreds of applications, uh, that helps. Yeah. Thank you so much uh, for, for that insight. Um, so if, if you're joining us, I'm here with Professor Nuzo. We have uh, people watching from uh, LinkedIn and on YouTube. Um, we will we'll take quite, uh, we'll take some questions and then hopefully uh, we can uh, continue our discussion. Um, so uh, most of the comments are uh, complimentary comments, uh, thanking you for joining us today. Uh, that's one question uh, for MPH students. Uh, so uh, the person wants to ask, if my background is not in health, can I apply for uh, a doctoral program or a master's program at Brown University? Um, so I would say yes. I mean, uh, let me give you an example. Uh, I have someone that's working in our pandemic center who I hired here. Um, her undergraduate background was in psychology. Uh, but um, she had done a summer research program trying to look at um, uh, mental health issue, issues in, mm -hmm. uh, in communities of color and um, other minority groups. And, you know, that was an instance where her undergraduate background was directly relevant. So um, I think that the public health field is strengthened by people who bring in training in other disciplines. Um, not every school thinks that way. Uh, I think Brown is a place where those sorts of things are kind of celebrated. Mm -hmm. um, but it always helps if you can explain that. So uh, I'm writing letters of recommendation for her for getting into an MPH program. And I have explained that I thought her undergraduate background is directly relevant. And here's how she's been able to... Uh, bring a richness to the work that we do that we might not have had had we not involved her. I think it helps if you can explain why you think your undergraduate or your background uh, uh, helps helps you. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't hinder you. Yeah. Um, it's going to be helpful. And, um, you know, I, I would be somewhat bold in that because, you know, sometimes you're, you may have a degree that's not health, but maybe it's highly quantitative, for instance. And you mm -hmm. can say, listen, I have really honed my quantitative skills, and that will be really helpful for me as I pursue a training in epidemiology and biostatistics or data science, whatever, you know, whatever it is. But just try to, you know, uh, package yourself in such a way that it's clear that you um, are going to come with your own set of skills that you can apply and then use the time in your program to continue to add to your toolbox in a way that's necessary for you to have the kind of career that you want to have and to have the kind of impact that you want to have. Great, great. Um, someone wants to know whether there's a, a cutoff for GPA. Not a strict cutoff. Um, I, I don't, I don't view that. Obviously, if there's like a low GPA, uh, it's, um, you know, that's I, I wouldn't say that helps you. Yeah. You know, a, a strict cutoff. Um, I will also say that sometimes people apply to public health school uh, to get a master's like decades after their undergraduate education yeah. and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sort of hard to, to understand to what extent they're still that same person. Yeah. And so that's where their other experiences and their letters of recommendation, you know, I really think uh, can help create a more complete uh, picture. But no. I'm not aware if there's a cutoff. It's possible that, you know, there's a triage process before anything ever gets to some of the faculty reviewers that I don't know, but 
I've, I'm not aware of a, of a strict cutoff. A strict cutoff, yeah. Okay, that's that's good to know. I mean, I always tell people don't don't ever self reject. Um, put your staff together, apply, and then see how it goes. Make sure you're you're putting your best foot forward in terms of you know making sure your your uh, personal statement, your recommendation letters, your resume, everything is 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 the is in best form, and then you only wish for the best. Um, and so, don't give up. I mean, I've had people, I know people who have not gone in on the first thing and sometimes they go off and like work for a couple of years and then they reapply and that, um, that shows determination. Yeah. Uh, in fact, I remember accepting somebody who we had previously, uh, um, not accepted. And in part, the fact that, you know, he reapplied was, an indication to us that he was really serious that he wanted to do this, that this wasn't just like, uh, well, I don't know what to do with myself. I'm not really bored <laughs> in my job. I just want to go and get another degree. Um, you know, it was really showed determination and commitment and that helps. And so, um, you know, you obviously want to put the best foot forward. If you think that there are issues that might be red flags, one of the thoughts is that you either address it directly in your personal statement. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little risky because you don't have a whole lot of space. And so you yeah. don't want to spend I'm talking about the negatives or you ask one of your letter writers if they will address it for you and okay. that's that's if you are particularly if you are approaching people who either ask you to write the letters for them or don't know you that well what you can do is um give them some guidance say i would be really helpful to me if you could address these things here's what i would recommend saying like you know she had you may notice her GPA is lower than whatever. It's my understanding that that was due to some personal issues, family mm-hmm. trouble in that year that negated. But ever since then, she has had nothing but success, really came back. I'm really impressed by her determination to overcome adversity. I mean, those are the kinds of things that you can uh, put in there. It's really helpful. Yeah, yeah. Everybody yeah. wants. We we all go through stuff, right? So none of us is perfect <laughs> without blemishes in our in our past. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's about being perfect. I think it's about showing determination, grit, and resilience, and the extent to which you can make that shine through somehow. I think that's that's also helpful. Awesome, awesome. Uh, we'll take a last question from Toraja Williams uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, she says, "Is it a prerequisite?" to reach out to professors before applying for the doctoral program? Uh, or or do you have to identify an advisor uh, before you can apply? Um, it depends on the school. Uh, I will tell you, I get all sorts of emails from folks and I just can't even reply. Like I can barely reply to them in part because I have, I don't, um, here at Brown, we, we have a common application process. So meaning we accept people on their merits into the program, and then we figure out who they will work with. So it's not just like, I want to work with a student, so I'm going to bring them in. No, they have to first be <laughs> go through an academic check. And so part of why I think engaging with professors beforehand um, is not that helpful is because I can't tell you anything. You have to first get in. Once you yeah. get in, then it's about working together. That said, first, it depends very much on the school. Some schools may yeah. very much expect you to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say also at Hopkins, it was very hard to 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 interact with students in advance. Um, but you should look hard at who uh, you might want to work with and come up with a list and make it clear to the in your application who you might want to work with and why. And I say the and why part because you may pick a list of people that are a little bit different. And what I would say is, you know, I might want to work with this person because of their experiencing working with large data sets. Additionally, this person has experience with veterinary medicine and therefore could help me in my, you know, like you want to paint a picture of what you want to do and why you've identified the faculty members as particularly being, being how you could benefit from studying with them and, and being mentored by them. But don't just pick one because, sometimes chances are like everybody application is trying to applicant is trying to pick that one person and that person yeah. there's no bandwidth. Uh, and then if that's all you've identified, then you're sunk. But if you identify, you know, a list of five or so people and ex- explain clearly why you would like to work with them, then it helps us better make a match. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. Explaining is is useful because I have seen students say, I would like to work with the following faculty. And in my view, I look at them and I'm like, I don't see what all these faculty have in common. So then to (laughs) me, it feels like you just like threw darts at the website. I'm sure that's not the case, but explain your rationale and it makes it, it makes it easier. Yeah, great. Um, Thraja, I hope I hope you've 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 gotten your your questions answered. Um, so I want us to to talk a bit about uh, DRPH. I think it's one of the uh, yeah. career trajectories that uh, public health professionals don't seem to understand quite well. Um, the PhD is much more common, mm-hmm. or like much more known than uh, the DRPH in 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 terms of advanced degrees. Uh, so for for people, they, they tend to say that, oh, if I want to go into academia, uh, then I must get a PhD, right? Um, so for you, how does, or how has your PhD, your DRPH uniquely prepare you uh, for academic roles in public health? Um, yeah, so first of all, public health, as a field um, across all the schools, there are a lot of degrees. <laughs> so it's it's already a, pro- a field that's sort of made more complicated by the existence of uh, various letter combinations. That yeah. Mm-hmm. So you might go somewhere and not get a PhD, you might get a doctor of science, mm-hmm. uh, or you'll get a PhD, or you'll get, you know, there's a variety of different things. And then even at the master's level, right, there's MHS, there's MPH, MSc, yeah, MSPH, right? So <laughs> that's just one thing to kind of stage setting. Uh, it doesn't have the same kind of traditional options. Uh, there, there are more than just the traditional options offered within the field. Um, so that I think kind of maybe takes some of the some of the conversation around the letters. It just it it opens it up a little bit. Um, that said, not all. DRPH programs are the same. So when you're saying, mm-hmm. how did your DRPH degree prepare you? I will tell you, when I did the DRPH um, at Johns Hopkins in epidemiology, it was essentially the same. It was basically the same degree as PhD, mm-hmm. except that I was in the DRPH because I was working full time with Dr. D.A. Henderson and um, who um, many folks who know public health will know and didn't want to stop working. So in order to do my degree part time, uh, while also being, a, you know, doing research at Johns Hopkins, that yeah. was the degree program I was I was slotted into. That program doesn't exist anymore, and the DRPH program that's at Hopkins is is, is a bit different than the one that I did. Okay. So I was really grateful for um, the very rigorous epi methods training that I got. Um, I will say I did feel like it was deficient in a number of areas. <laughs> Uh, that I think is important, like, um, you know, understanding how the world works and, yeah. you know, some of the more practical skills that I, that I think are really important in having a, a public health career and impact. I've been able to supplement and, and get training in other ways. But um, so first of all, I think it depends on the degree program. DRPH programs at different places are very different. Um, mm-hmm. And so yeah. I think one of the things we should look at is, will this program give me the skills that I want? I would say that degree DRPH degrees, um, while it is not terribly common for people who graduate to pursue academic careers, I think a large part of that is due to the fact that they often attract people who are already working in public in practice. Yeah. So there are yeah. often people who are in government or working for some organization who would like to do research gain additional training and continue to have an impact in their careers or possibly, you know, pivot into another like-minded career, but not necessarily completely change and go into, to academia. It is possible to, to a traditional um, program, but the DRPH programs in most places are often part-time or they're, you know, accelerated, assuming that somebody has some kind of other position. They often require people to have worked for a while. So they partially attract people who just have a different trajectory than someone who, you know, finished up a bachelor's degree, now wants to go and get a PhD, and then wants to go do a couple of postdocs before they get an academic position. Um, Mm -hmm. It can be done, but I think it has to be done strategically if that's really what you want. 
Um, I am obviously a, like a very biased <laughs> uh, defender of the PhD, the DRPH program in part because I think it tends to equip students with the skills that I need, that I think you need to have a, a career of public health impact. I think it's, it's aimed to train future public health leaders. And I think that that's really important, mm -hmm. but I think if, if I learned anything is that there's multiple ways to build a career and there's multiple pathways to getting to the same place. So I wouldn't stress too much about it. I would pursue the degree that you think is going to be the best for you. And sometimes that's a function of, uh, well, I don't want to give up my job. Uh, I want to keep, but I do want to study. Um, or sometimes it's this school is offering me a lot more money than this other school. <laughs> and I think you should very much, um, <laughs> take those factors into consideration. Yeah. Because it's true. I don't think people go into the field of public health to get rich. And so whether the degree is going to set you up for the career that you want to have and not bankrupt you in the process is a really, really important consideration. Yeah. So when, uh, five, five years of uh, stipend is really challenging. Anyway, so um, <laughs> let's 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 dive uh, into at other points in your life, right? When you're in your twenties, maybe it's, yeah, it seems like a lot yeah. of money. But if you are later in your career and you think, could I give you know stop contributing to my retirement in order to go to school full time to do you know this uh, to live on this subsistence stipend and support my family? That's a really hard thing, I think, for some yeah. people to be able to absorb. So. Yeah, that's 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 really true. That's I think that's one of the main challenges that um, I think uh, students in other um, institutions are trying to address. Um, at least uh, you know, pay PhD students some level of uh, you know compensation that can help sustain them uh, quite well. Anyways, um, I, I know we are almost. Uh, hitting 4 p.m. I want us to take the rest of the time and and talk briefly about uh, global health security. Uh, I know you've you've talked uh, you know quite a lot initially about the glo the global security index, um, and I think my so my my first paper was actually um, taking your book or your project global security index and then comparing it with how uh OECD countries have actually fed in in yeah. in their response to COVID-19 and our results was quite um intriguing as you said like COVID-19 has really shown that no no country it's is immune or no country is quite yeah. ready for you know a catastrophic event like COVID-19 so in in your opinion in what ways has the COVID-19 pandemic reshaped our understanding of global health security um so i mean i, I think there was a, a temporary time where people were looking at the you know how high income countries did and many high income countries were considered the better prepared countries although actually uh the index scores that wasn't uh very highly correlated with income so yeah some highly prepared countries were low income countries and anyway so income wasn't really the, the big term but nonetheless we saw some of the higher prepared countries like the united states and the united kingdom uh not do as well as we thought and there was a time period where they're we like well maybe preparedness doesn't matter um we've done <laughs> subsequent analyses that refute that preparedness matters yes, uh, capacities yes. are important if you use them if you exercise them but mm -hmm. they're also not story it's it's what we call and uh, what we say in epidemiology we like to talk about things being necessary but not sufficient mm -hmm. yeah um, preparing countries building their public health capacities their healthcare capacities necessary but not sufficient the social factors political factors leadership factors also really important yeah um they're hard to hard to you know they, there's a longer term uh arc of change necessary for those factors so it's important to keep building capacities and to continue to engage with communities. I actually think one of the things that the pandemic has exposed our failure to address, to adopt global health best practices. Mm -hmm. So if you've worked in global health settings, particularly settings where there is really strong community um, based organization infrastructure that in part was put in place because of maybe deficiencies in the national governments or limited capacities of national governments, 
I actually think that there's a lot of lessons to be learned there that higher income countries could benefit from, like the importance of, um, you know, I'm so struck by a quote that um, one of our Johns Hopkins um, colleagues, uh, Dr. Tolbert Nienzwa, um, mm-hmm. uh, said, which is that if you don't, you know, I'm going to paraphrase, but something of effect of like, if you don't have the public support, you don't have a public health intervention. Yeah. That's well understood in context, but let me tell you, American leadership needed to learn. <laughs> so I really think that we need to look to um, uh, other countries for some real benefits uh, and, and, and lessons that um, high income countries could really, really benefit from. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So, and certainly countries that have had more recent experience with infectious disease emergencies. Yeah. We were clearly mm-hmm. much better able to respond quickly than countries like the United States that, you know, in recent years maybe thought that was a problem of over there when mm-hmm. in fact yeah. it increased the problem of right here. Yeah. And one one uh issue that we, we, we found in our paper was that I think the the first security index didn't quite take into account, as you said, political the political yeah. dynamics and um leadership. A uh, bit, but not sufficiently, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Some of it is changing, right? It's not an inherent trait of a country, it's who happens yeah. to be in power at that mm-hmm. point and like that's a hard thing to measure in advance. Yeah. Uh, so election leaders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um uh, so and, and and you 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 mentioned in the in the beginning that we we have to train uh public health leaders to 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 be able to identify these key areas and how to uh collaborate with you know these important agencies uh with with you i don't like one one journalist was um uh arguing that the pandemic uh you know the u.s didn't do well because you know they had doctors at the forefront of communication which in in his view was not supposed to be like that uh but do you like do you agree with that kind of a session or you think that you know uh professionals need to get involved with you directly communicating with the public in terms of um, leadership decisions yes i mean there are lots of communication failures and i'm not sure it's the discipline you know the training of the of the speakers that's the problem in fact physicians tend to score higher in polls in terms of trust so I, i'm not sure that that's really it what I do think, though, is that how we communicate is not matched. It's it's not. It can't just be a repackaging of the facts. And unfortunately, I think so much of risk communication teaches you how to package the facts in a way that's maybe understandable. It's yeah. not a deficit of facts. I think. I, I mean, I've seen that firsthand in talking to people. Uh, it's it's about people's beliefs. Yeah. Yeah. If we want to change behavior, we have to change beliefs, and that requires different communication strategies than than we teach people. That said. It's not all about communication. I think in the field, we were trying to pin all of our failures onto poor communication when in fact, there was a real deficit in service. There was a real deficit in strategy. I mean, if you remember at the start of the pandemic in the US, the country was on board. But after a few weeks, after we told them, if you stayed home for two weeks, we'd crush the curve and everything would be great. Uh, after a few weeks, they were like, okay, that didn't work. So what next? And we never, like, we never sufficiently answered that question. Yeah. It's not just about communication. It's also about strategy. It's about government effectiveness. It's about being in people's lives meaningfully in a pre-pandemic way. And I will tell you, so many of the people I talked to, you know, I actually stopped doing this, but they would always tell me like, well, we just don't know who to trust. And I would say, well, do you have to be a doctor? And they would almost always tell me they didn't have one. Mm-hmm. So there are bigger problems than just communication. There are yeah. infrastructure problems there. There's real problems in terms of access care, quality of care. So we've got bigger problems. Communication is important for sure. And I do think we need to overhaul how we teach it and what we teach people to do. Um, but just glibly telling people the facts uh, is not going to cut it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, I mean, before I let you go, uh, if, if uh, I know you've, you've spoken about changing um you know, uh, public health education, how we viewed public health education 
if if you were to change or to add you know s- something to uh what is currently being taught what like what would be the one of the most important you know competencies you would you would love for students to have uh b- before they graduate yeah. from for example a doctoral program or uh perhaps a master's program so um at our school we've uh, piloted a new pro- uh, course that's um taught co-taught by my two of my pandemic center colleagues uh, dr beth cameron and dr wilma james um it's called pandemic game changers and and the the premise of that class is that uh, pandemic leadership or you know just public health professionals they're going to find themselves in instances which they are dealing with uncertain information maybe not complete data but there may be good reason to try to take proactive measures. Uh, mm-hmm. And that's going to require getting buy-in from your bosses and political leadership, et cetera. It's going to be able to kind of act with the information you have, not the information that you wish you have that you might not have for months. Um, and so basically we're trying to train people to make effective decisions in the face of uncertainty and to do so in a way that leads to changed outcomes such that we get political leadership. So we're teaching them to write briefing memos and to do, uh, you know, effective briefings, like verbal briefings, how to navigate the system and to get things done. Those kind of soft skills are really important for having an impact and not really part of a traditional public health education. So that's just one way. And we're about to launch not just a class, but we're launching a larger, it'll be a global uh, pandemic game changers program. Um, Initially, I'm working with some institutions um, on the African continent, as well as um, in the U.S. to try to do this. We're also trying to diversify who are pandemic leaders because yeah. we can't have in the same same familiar faces making all the decisions. We need to make sure that uh, you know the hardest hit communities are represented in the pandemic decision making because otherwise we're not going to make the accurate and operationally feasible decisions. Yeah, great, great. I think that's 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 um, an interesting perspective uh, because people often I argue that. Uh, it's, it's not really global health when it's only few people who who are uh, taking some of the important decisions uh, that that is required. Well, thank you so much for for joining us today. It's, it's been an interesting conversation, um, and I'm really excited that you are able to 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 join us today. Hopefully, we we'll, would we'll have the opportunity to collaborate more in the future. Um, okay. Because I, I also love working in that uh, particular uh, area. I had a conversation with uh, Dr. Crystal last week, uh, Crystal Watson, who is also at health, uh, uh, the Center of Health Security. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll have the opportunity to, to collaborate. So your, your last words to my viewers and uh, all the young uh, public health professionals. I'm just so thrilled that there's this level of interest in the field and like you are the future of it. And, um, you know, this gives me so much hope for our future because one thing is clear, the people who are coming to the field now are doing so out of like a deep passion and motivation for change, Mm -hmm. not just to, you know, uh, accumulate credentials and laurels. Uh, People want to fix the world and, you know, there's a lot about the world to be fixed, but um, you know, there are multiple pathways and multiple ways to have an impact. Uh, so I wouldn't fret the specific path too much. Uh, just make sure that you, as I said, my North Star is wondering, you know, can I make a difference? Can I yeah. use the skills that I have? And I think if you follow that, you're going to be fine and, and um, you're, you're going to have um, an important contribution. And we're so very grateful to you for your willingness to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, And enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, if you just join us, uh, we uh, had a conversation with uh, Professor Nuzo, who is uh, the director of the Pandemic Center at Brown University, uh, which is uh, one of the Ivy Leagues, uh, uh, Ivy League universities. Uh, So she was uh she was here at Hopkins for several years and then moved to Brown University and I'm sure she's she's highlighted quite a number of important things uh respect to um 
public health education and also uh, applying to graduate schools, uh, especially in, in the field of public health. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, if this is your first time, uh, this is the Scholars Table. We st- were streaming on LinkedIn and YouTube. Um, uh, before you leave, for those uh, who join us on, on YouTube, uh, kindly subscribe um, and share with, with your friends who may be interested in uh, applying to public health. Uh, I think there's one question. Please, does MPH increase your chance of gaining admission in in residency? If, if, you, if you mean clinical residency, uh, then uh, I would say yes, it, it does increase uh, your chances. But um, it's more of what you do with the, with the MPH, right? So if you do your MPH and you have a couple of publications, that will significantly increase your chances. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much for, for, for joining us today. Um, we would have uh, uh, Mr. Paul Wong, who is the Senior uh, Program Associate at Hopkins with us on Friday uh, to talk about scholarship offers, so we are we are going to deal with only scholarships uh, this Friday. Uh, we initially booked him for last week Thursday, but he couldn't join us. Uh, but he's he he uh, he has confirmed that he will be able to join us on Friday. So uh, please join us on Friday to talk about scholarships and admissions at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, So thank you so much again. Uh, Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.